Aloha and good afternoon, maybe even good morning or good evening, depending where in the world you are. My name is Edwin. I'll be your storyteller today. Today I'll be reading from Redwall by Brian Jakes. Now, Redwall is both the novel and the series, the first in the series. There are some prequels, I suppose, that were written after the effect, but Redwall is the is the flagship novel where Brian Jake establishes this wonderful world of imagination. Redwall Abbey, Mossflower Woods, and all the iconic characters therein. Let's see, where are we going to pick up today? We are the the Redwall novel is divided up into two books. And book two is entitled The Quest. So we'll be starting off with chapter one of book two. <laughs> now, the image I have up here is actually from the Lone Patrol. It is not Basil Stag here, but I imagine Basil Stag here looks very much like this. And one of my absolute favorite characters from the Red Wall series, Basil Stag here, immediately, immediately memorable. <laughs> oh, there was another image that was from the that was drawn during the Long Patrol. Now, these illustrations are done by Elronimus Flash, illustrated by Amy Lester. Oh, did I not save it? How unfortunate. I'll get that up next time. But a, a great image of the tapestry. Hey, good morning, Amy Lester. I should say good afternoon. So Amy has done the colors for these. Amy is actually working on a banner for the YouTube channel. I can I can draw just a little bit. <laughs> I can talk and I can garden and do all sorts of things, but I am not a graphic designer. So Amy's efforts for our channel's banner are greatly appreciated. And I say our channel. You know, a channel that reads, a channel that reads stories, a channel that reads stories, classic stories, is not going to be a, a YouTube le leviathan. <laughs> but it's one of the things I love is the participation of our audience. You know, particularly some of the sharing in our Discord server, and then the great art that we get from. Elrod and from Amy Lester. Quack for Gondor, the ducks of Gondor. <laughs> All right. How's everyone doing, by the way? It is, it is definitely fall now, both in fact and in effect. Working in my garden area some this morning, it was nice and cool. Not cold but cool and pleasant outside. I've lived in Hawaii for over two decades, and I missed, I missed seasons. I missed the change of the color of the, the leaves. I missed all these things, and I'm enjoying it immensely. But I'm going to be busy before it gets, before it gets too cold, getting, getting my garden, getting my garden bed sent for spring. Ah, looking forward to it. Just seeing the changes, seeing the changes. In Hawaii, we didn't really have that, that sense of progression. It was either warm or less warm, generally not hot. Uh, I was reminded this summer, I moved from Hawaii to North Carolina. And North Carolina summers are definitely... Whew, from July right up into the beginning of September, certainly much more brutal than than Hawaii summers. So Hawaii was either warm or less warm, rainy, less rainy, but it kind of stayed in a narrow band all year, and so you don't get that you don't get that feeling of progression. Amy Lester says, "Hope you guys do well with winter." 
I think you guys are far enough north to get snow. Well, now, when I was a child, when I was a child, it would snow a couple times a year. But um, my family has told me it hasn't really snowed much the past couple of years. So hopefully this year will be the exception. In fact, I think the only frozen precipitation our area got, we saw in February, uh, toward the end of February, it sleeted just enough for some accumulation but then it melted within the hour but i would like to see a snow i miss snow i love a white christmas <laughs> and there's a poo in mcclary he says he's here all right well oh and there's a melissa lester the lovely lasse good to see you melissa Get into the right chapter. That helps. <laughs> Again, we're reading Red Wall by Brian Jakes. We're in book two, chapter one. I think I put the previous episodes, if you need to get caught up. Uh, if I didn't include them in the description to the video, I will edit it so that it shows correctly. I suppose I should make playlists and such also. Hey, there is a Laura W. Good to see you. And with that, let us begin. Matthias came awake slowly. He blinked, yawned, and stretched his body luxuriously. The sun was setting, turning the little stream into a flow of molten red and gold-tinged with deep shadow. He lay calm, savoring the peace and quiet of the woodland summer evening. Reality struck him like a thunderbolt. He sprang to his feet, instantly forgetting the beauty that surrounded him. Lying there snoring and sleeping, like a lazy little idiot. And all the while, Redwall Abbey and his friends were under attack. Furious with himself, Matthias strode off angrily into the darkening trees. He could find no word strong enough to express his self-contempt. It was not until he had blundered and crashed along his way for some time, wildly upbraiding himself that he calmed down with the realization that he was well and truly lost. No tree, path, or landmark looked remotely familiar. He despaired of ever seeing Redwall again. Night closed in on the small mouse, wandering alone in the depths of Mossflower Wood. Strange imaginary shapes flitted about in the gloom, Eerie cries pierced the still air. Trees and bushes reached out, their branches to catch and scratch like living things with claws. Trembling, Matthias took refuge in an old beech trunk that had once been riven by lightning. Gradually, he became critical of himself again. The great warrior... Frightened of the dark, like a baby church mouse. From somewhere overhead he heard a scratching noise. Summoning up all his courage, he banished his fears. Drawing Shadow's dagger, he stepped out in the open, calling aloud in what he hoped was a gruff voice. Who's doing all that scratching and scraping? Come out and show yourself if you're a friend. But if it's a rat out there, then you'd best start running. Otherwise, you'll have to deal with me, Matthias, a warrior of Redwall. Having spoken his peace, Matthias felt his confidence surge back. He stood tense and alert. However, he received no answer, save the mocking echo of his own voice ringing back at him through the dark woodlands. A slight noise at his back caused Matthias to wheel about with the dagger upraised. He found himself confronted by a baby red squirrel. 
It gazed up at him curiously, sucking noisily on its paw. <laughs> Matthias practically dropped the dagger through laughing so much. So this was the nameless terror that stalked the night. The tiny creature continued sucking its paw, shifting from foot to foot, its bushy tail curled up over its small back, higher than the tips of its ears. Matthias stooped, speaking gently for fear of frightening the infant. Hello there. My name's Matthias. What's yours? The baby squirrel continued sucking on its paw. Do your mummy and daddy know you're out? It nodded its head. Are you lost, little one? It shook its head. Do you talk? It shook its head. Do you often wander about like this at night? It nodded. Matthias smiled disarmingly. He threw his paws open wide. I'm lost, he said. The paw sucking continued without comment. I come from Redwall Abbey. Suck, suck, suck. Do you know where that is? The baby squirrel nodded. Matthias was overjoyed. Oh, my little friend, please, could you show me the way, he asked. It nodded. Thank you very much. The tiny squirrel hopped and shuffled a short way into the woods. Turning to Matthias, it took its paw from its mouth and beckoned him to follow. He needed no second urging. Suck, suck, suck. Well, at least Matthias thought aloud. If I lose sight of this fellow, I'll be able to hear him. The baby squirrel smiled and nodded and sucked. Chapter Two <laughs> Chapter Two Abbot Mortimer sat in the grass of the abbey quarters. All around him, the defenders who had been sent down from the wall lay in slumber. Not knowing when the rats were going to stop fighting, and realizing that they might not, the kindly abbot advised those who had been relieved to try and get some sleep. Methuselah came shuffling, shuffling up. With a sigh and a groan, he sat down on the grass alongside his abbot, who greeted him courteously. Good evening, Brother Methuselah. The old gatehouse keeper adjusted his spectacles and sniffed the air. And a good evening to you, Father Abbot. How goes the battle against the rats? The abbot folded his paws within his wide sleeves. It goes well for us, old one. Though, how I can say that anything goes well, which causes death and injury to living creatures, is beyond me. We live in strange times, my friend. Methuselah grinned and wrinkled his nose. Oh, but still, it goes well. Indeed it does. But why do you smile, Methuselah? What secret are you keeping from me? Oh, Father Abbot, you read me like a book. I do have a secret. But trust me, all will be made known to you in the fullness of time. The Abbot shrugged. No doubt it will. But please, make it soon. We're not getting any younger, you and I. Oh, come now, said Methuselah. Compared with me, you're still a mouse in your prime. Yet, like many others that think my senses are failing, you cannot see half the things that my old eyes observe. How so? inquired the abbot. Methuselah touched a paw to his nose knowingly. For instance, did you notice there is a breeze tonight? No, I, 
I don't suppose you did. Then look at the top of that old elm tree sticking up above the wall. Yes, that one over by the small door. Tell me, oh, do you see? The abbot's eyes followed Methuselah's paw until he saw the tree in question. He studied it for a moment, then turned to the old mouse. I see the top of an old elm tree growing out of the woods. But what is unusual about that? Methuselah shook his head reprovingly. He still cannot see. Dear me, if the breeze is blowing from the south, then the elm tree would move its leaves and branches in a northerly direction, as it has always done. But that particular tree is choosing to disobey nature. It is swaying from east to west. This can only mean one thing. Somebody is using that tree for a purpose. At least, that is what I think. Do you agree? Without replying or showing any sign of alarm whatsoever, the abbot arose. Walking calmly over to the gatehouse wall, he beckoned silently to Constance. The badger descended the steps. She had a whispered conference with the abbot, nodding in the direction of the elm. Less than a minute later, Constance followed by Winifred the Otter, Ambrose Spike, and a few others, padded carefully on the top of the wall, taking great pains not to be seen. On the woodland side, Cluny whispered commands to his followers as they pushed the plank toward the wall from their perch in the elm tree. Steady now, cheese thief, you moron. Keep your end up. Keep it going upwards, not down. Cheese thief struggled to obey. It was all right for the chief, sitting back there giving out his orders. He didn't have to balance with one claw pushing a silly plank about with the other. Cheese thief slipped. With a squeak of dismay, he let go of the plank. It clattered against a branch. Fortunately, Scrag the weasel was on the alert. He caught the end of the plank, steadying it. Cheese Thief regained his balance and clung miserably to his perch as Cluny hissed in rage at him. Clown! Bungling buffoon! Get out of the way! Shift your fat idle carcass and let Scrag take over! Burning with resentment, Cheese Thief was shoved unceremoniously aside. Cluny aimed to kick at him as the efficient weasel took his place. You just sit there and be still, Cluny snarled, and try not to make enough noise to waken the entire abbey. Scrag moved with skill and economy, issuing quiet, confident directions to the others. Up a bit, left a touch, take it forward steady. Now, good, hold it. The long plank snaked out and upward, coming to rest gently but firmly on the parapet edge. Scrag saluted Cloney. Plank in position and ready, chief. Cheese thief shot Scrag a venomous glance. Cloney climbed onto the plank and tested it. The improvised bridge wobbled and sprang a bit, but it held. Clooney turned to the raiding party. I'll go first. We'd better have only one at a time on the plank. When I'm on the parapet, I'll steady the other end. Scrag, you come next. The rest of you follow. Clooney held on to branches for as long as he could. Soon he was out on the middle of the plank with nothing to steady him trying hard not to glance downward. At the dizzying drop, he inched his way up the plank toward the wall.
Clooney was almost in reach of his goal when Constance appeared on the parapet. She gave the plank a mighty kick, sending it into space. With a shout of dismay, Clooney plunged earthward, snapping branches as he went. Winifred fired off a pebble from her sling, knocking a ferret clean out of his perch into empty space. Scrag still held one end of the plank. He leaned precariously out from the elm to see where Clooney fell. Seizing his opportunity for revenge, Cheese Thief shoved Scrag hard in the back. The weasel dropped like a stone with the plank on top of him. Clooney's followers were kicking each other and screaming as they tried to clamber down from the high elm branches. Leaning across the parapet, Constance and her friends watched the panic-stricken animals descending. Winifred the otter managed to speed up the retreat with a few well-aimed stones from her sling. The defenders viewed their work with grim satisfaction. Ambrose Spike squinted short-sightedly down at the darkened woodland floor. He tried to assess the casualties. How many did we get? he inquired. Hard to tell in this light, replied Winifred, but I'd swear that was Clooney Constance tipped off the plank. The badger's brow creased. She shot a quizzical glance at the otter. So you saw him too? I'm glad you did. I thought I was seeing double for a moment back there. How could Clooney be in two places at once? I'm sure I saw him standing in the meadow not ten minutes ago. Winifred shrugged. Well, let's just hope it was Clooney. Personally, I'd like to think he's lying somewhere down there now, dead as a door now. Constance peered downward. Difficult to say, really. There seems to be around half a dozen or so laid out down there. Can't tell for sure. Too much shadow and darkness. Still, I don't think any creature could survive a fall from this height. Maybe we'd better go and see, suggested Ambrose. The defenders looked toward Constance. Maybe not, the badger said thoughtfully. No, I don't like it. It suddenly strikes me this could be a diversionary tactic to draw us away from the gatehouse wall. If it was Clooney who fell from the plank, all well and good, but if it wasn't, then he's still around the front. It won't serve any useful purpose counting dead bodies. Let's get back to the main action. Led by Constance, the defenders filed hurriedly off. Cheese Thief slunk cautiously out of the undergrowth. It was safe to move now. The woodlanders had gone from the parapet. Behind him, limping and complaining, the survivors of the ill-fated party. Cheese Thief ignored them as he moved among the bodies that had fallen from the high branches. Four rats, a ferret, and one weasel. Three of the rats and the ferret were dead. They lay where they had fallen, their limbs in grotesque positions. The survivors immediately pounced upon the bodies of their fallen comrades, plundering weapons and objects of clothing that they had coveted. Cheese Thief stood riveted by the single eye. Clooney was still alive. Beneath the plank, Scrag stirred and groaned. Amazingly, too, he had survived. Cheese Thief sprang into action, surprised that Scrag still lived but fatalistically accepting that nothing could cure Clooney. Quick! Get that plank over here, you lot! We got to get the chief out of here! Using the plank as an improvised stretcher, they carefully lifted Clooney onto it. Cheese Thief knew Clooney was watching him. Tenderly, he lifted the dangling tail and arranged it gently alongside his leader. Try not to move, chief. Lie still. We'll get you soon back to camp. 
The stretcher bears moved off slowly through the woods. Cheese thief avoided Clooney's eye. An idea was taking form in his mind. He sniffed piteously, wiping an imaginary tear from his cheek. Oh, poor old Scrag! What a good weasel! I think he's still alive. Listen, you lot, carry on and get the chief home safely. I'll double back and see if I can help Scrag. Cheese Thief sniggered to himself as the survivors disappeared into the night, carrying Clooney on the plank. Matthias followed the baby squirrel through the bramble and brush. Whenever he tried to communicate, all that he received was a nod or a shake of the tiny creature's head. They had been traveling for quite a long time. As the pale fingers of dawn crept across the sky, Matthias was beginning to doubt that his companion knew the way. Then suddenly, the little fellow pointed to the east with his paw. In the distance, Matthias could make out the shape of the abbey. Let's see, do I have the, do I have the abbey picture in here? Maybe. Ah, there we go. Again, this was from this is from the Long Patrol, but still <laughs> gives us a little bit of context. Then suddenly the little fellow pointed to the east with his paw. In the distance Matthias could make out the shape of the abbey. There's no place like home, he said thankfully. What a splendid pathfinder you are, my friend. Still sucking his paw, the small squirrel smiled shyly. He took hold of Matthias's tail as they went forward together, the mouse talking animatedly, the squirrel nodding vigorously. I'll take you to Friar Hugo's kitchen and see that he gives you the nicest breakfast that you've ever had. Now, what do you say to that? Suck, suck, and nod, nod. When Matthias arrived at the wall, he felt like patting the old red sandstone. He turned to his companion. This is where I live. A noise nearby caused them both to freeze momentarily. It sounded like some creature groaning. Instinctively, Matthias and the squirrels ducked down among the ferns. Cautiously, they crept along in the direction of the sounds. Silently parting the ferns, they gazed in horror at the dreadful scene among the base of the elm tree. Among the dead animals that lay stretched in un unnatural attitudes was a badly injured weasel. He was moaning and twitching fitfully. Before either of the friends could decide what to do, a rat appeared on the scene. They remained motionless. Cheese Thief was in a cheery mood. He hummed happily under his breath. Mm -mm -mm. Weasel's got to go. Under his breath, as he prodded Scrag with his foot. Scrag, wake up. It's me, Cheese Thief. Oh, come on now. I'm sure you remember me, the stupid one, the rat whose job you were going to take. Scrag's eyes were barely open. He groaned in agony. Cheese thief cocked a mockingly sympathetic ear. Oh, what's that, Scrag, me old mate? Tired, are you? Yes, you must be, lying there like that. Tell you what, I'll help you go to sleep, shall I? The rat placed his foot on the weasel's throat and began pressing down. Scrag struggled feebly, fighting for breath, unable to stop his tormentor. Cheese thief took malicious pleasure in his revenge. Cruelly, he leaned his full weight upon the weasel's rasping throat. Hush now, hush. 
Go to sleep, Scrag. Dream of the command you never had. Scrag made one final gurgling whimper and lay still. Cheese Thief went off, chuckling with satisfaction. Hidden in the ferns, Matthias and the baby squirrel held their breath in disbelief. They had seen murder committed. Matthias and the squirrel waited until they were sure the coast was clear. At last they emerged from the ferns, and Matthias, cupping his paws around his mouth, ventured a low halloo up the wall. There was no reply. The little squirrel shook his head. He pointed to the floor with his paw in a gesture that Matthias inter interpreted as stop here. With breathtaking speed and skill, the tiny creature raced up the trunk of the old elm. Reaching the thin branches above the parapet, he ran out along one. Using it as a springboard, he bounced nimbly onto the ramparts and vanished, sucking fiercely at his paw. Matthias had not long to wait before the small door in the wall nearby grated open on its rusty hinges, and Constance peered cautiously out. Seeing Matthias, she ran to greet him, with the little squirrel perched upon her back. Matthias was not sure what sort of reception was in store for him. He needed not have worried. Constance hugged him, patted his back, and shook him by the paw. The badger forestalled the explanation that was upon the young mouse's lips. She beckoned Matthias inside, shutting the door behind him. You can tell us everything later, Matthias. Right now, I insist you come to the main gate. There's something you must see. A minute or two later, all four were standing on the gatehouse wall shoulder to shoulder with countless other defenders. Clooney's horde was retreating, back down the road to their camp at St. Ninian's Church. There was a wild cheering from the ranks of mice and woodlanders. Clooney was being borne upon the plank in the midst of his army. Redtooth, who was still disguised in the warlord's battle armor, had draped a blanket over Clooney to hide him and keep up the masquerade. But nobody was fooled. Both sides of the wall had heard the tale of misadventure in all its gory detail. They knew the strutting rat in armor was not Clooney the Scourge. Red Tooth nevertheless strode proudly along. Clooney might not recover. Beside, he reveled in the respect that he had received. Dressed as he was in such barbaric finery, he knew that it was only borrowed plumage, but he could always hope that the position might become permanent. On top of the gatehouse ramparts, feelings read high. The abbot had issued strict orders that no missiles or weaponry be discharged at the enemy in retreat. Mid the cheering, there was quite a bit of resentful grumbling. Why not smash Clooney's army once and for all? Now that they were on the run, this was the proper time to consolidate a resounding Red Wall victory. But the good Father Abbot would not hear of it. Like a true gentle mouse, he believed in tender tempering triumph with mercy. The jubilatory sounds died away to an eerie silence, eerie silence as the rats toiled raggedly off down the road, raising a column of dust in the early dawn. Dispirited and battle-worn, carrying their fallen leader, the maimed and wounded hobbled painfully along at the rear, the bitter ashes of vanquishment and defeat mingling with the dust from their stumbling vanguard. Even the silent victors began to realize that victory came at a high price. Freshly dug graves and a crowded infirmary bore silent witness to the reality of war. Matthias felt a gentle paw entwining with his own. It was cornflower, cornflower. Relief showed in her eyes and her voice. Oh, Matthias!
Elias, thank goodness you're back safe. It was dreadful. Not knowing where you were or what had become of you. I thought that you'd never come back. I'm like an old penny. I always come back, Matthias whispered. Oh, by the way, how is your father? Cornflower brightened up. Oh, he's made a marvelous recovery. He refused to lie in bed and has been up in the wall helping out. You can't keep a good field mouse down, my dad always says. Matthias barely had time to bid Cornflower a hasty goodbye before he was ushered off to the abbot's room for an early morning conference. He took his seat and looked round the table. There was Constance, Ambrose, Winifred, Formal, the abbot, and also his friend, the baby squirrel. He stood on a stool dipping his paw into a bowl of milk and honey, sucking at it with noisy enjoyment. I, I think you would have been in trouble without Silent Sam here, Matthias, the abbot said. The young mouse nodded. I certainly would have, Father Abbot. So that's his name, Silent Sam. Well, he certainly lives up to it. Indeed he does, replied the abbot. His mother and father are old friends of mine. They'll pick up his tracks and be along here later to collect him. Do you know, this little chap hasn't spoken since he was born. I've tried every remedy known to Redwall on him, but none has worked. So he was named Silent Sam. Oh, but don't let that fool you. He knows moss flower wood like the back of his paw, don't you, Sam? The tiny squirrel licked his paw and smiled. He indicated a large circle with it, pointing at himself with his unsticky paw. Matthias reached over and shook the paw heartily. My thanks to you, silent Sam. You are truly a great pathfinder. During the meeting, there was much useful information exchanged. Matthias told of the rescue at St. Ninian's and his encounter with the strange hare. Surely you don't mean Basil Stag Hare, cried Constance. Well, I never... Is that old eccentric still bobbing around? I expect we'll see him turn up with the Vole family around lunchtime. I never knew Basil to miss the chance of a free lunch back in the days. The assembled creature passed a vote of thanks to Matthias for his resourcefulness and bravery. Matthias blushed. Then he sat listening intently while those who had taken part in the battle recounted all they could remember. In the aftermath of that memorable conflict, there was much speculation as to what the future held. Would Clooney recover from his injuries? Had his horde been so soundly defeated that they had learned their lesson? Or would they be back? <coughs> it was the abbot's opinion that Clooney and his rabble would not bother Redwall again. Their leader's injuries would doubtless prove fatal. This statement was strongly opposed by the others, and Constance was elected to speak for them. Clooney is still the prime factor, said the badger. That rat is physically tougher than we could ever imagine. It's only a matter of time until he recovers sufficiently to attack us again. Constance pounded upon the table with a heavy paw, emphasizing each word. And make no mistake about it. Clooney the Scourge will attack Redwall again. I'd stake my life on it. Think for a moment. If Clooney were to give up the idea of conquering this abbey, he would lose both face and credibility with the army he commands. Furthermore, and most important of all, word would spread across the land that Clooney was not invincible, that he could be beaten by mice. 
This would mean the end of Clooney as a legend of terror. So you see, when Clooney recovers, he will be virtually forced to mount a second assault upon Redwall. There was a sober silence around the table. The abbot rose. He had arrived at a decision. So be it. I have listened to your counsel and opinions, my dear and trusted friends. Although I yearn for peace, I feel that I must base my judgment on your words, which I know to be true. Therefore, my powers, Abbot, and any assistance that I can give you are yours for the asking. It is my wish that Constance, Matthias, Winifred, Ambrose, and Formal take complete command at Redwall in the event of a second invasion. I will concern myself with aiding the injured and feeding the hungry. And now, my friends, I must adjourn this meeting, as I have other matters to attend to. Come, Sam, we must wash those sticky little paws before your parents arrive. Oh, and before I forget, Matthias, Brother Methuselah would like to talk to you. He is in Great Hall. That brings us to Chapter 3, which I think we will save for the next story time. A <laughs> little bit of a shorter one this morning, or this afternoon, but I need to get back out in the garden post-haste and do some more. But it's always... Uh, it's always a good day to read some Red Wall. I will probably do another morning reading. Uh, probably Red Wall the rest of this week. But I'm going to read through some Sherlock Holmes stories. And I think, um, I think Sherlock Holmes, we may work in a Sherlock Holmes story next week. And I also have to look up our sign Lupin. Those look kind of interesting. The only thing, since they are full of French names, I'll have to use a neutral accent, but I'll have to look up all the all the French pronunciations. <laughs> I think we had Arsène, Arsène Lupin is kind of an, an investigator character in the in the form of Sherlock Holmes. Not exactly the same same character though, but we might perform one of those one day. What do you think, gang? Do we want do we want a Sherlock Holmes day every week during the during the daytime? Uh, and then I think the plan right now still remains after we finish um after we finish Redwall, the novel, I think the next Redwall story I want to do is Mossflower. Uh, it was a lot of fun to read last time, but as, as I went back and listened and, and I got a few comments, there was a lot of background noise in it, so I'd like to have a really clean reading of Mossflower. So I think that'll be next up. And just... To see today brings us exactly a third of the way through Red Wall. <laughs> All right. Well, we will say goodbye here. I'm going to get some lunch and get busy. I don't know if there'll be a story time tonight. Next one at night, maybe on Thursday. I've just got to double check uh, Flash's channel. We'll see how that goes. If I get the inch on Wednesday, I may do some extra reading. We'll see. All right. Well, thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. And until we meet again, may God bless you and your families. Aloha. <laughs>